Good evening and welcome to this book discussion on Educating Harlem, A Century of Schooling and Resistance in a Black Community, a co-edited volume by Ansley Erickson and Ernest Morrell and their team of contributors and collaborators. We look forward to an exciting and timely conversation, an example of how history must inform our work in the present and for the future. Tonight's event is the first in a year-long series through which Teachers College celebrates and recognizes the importance of the Harlem Renaissance at its 100th anniversary. The Renaissance's intensive creativity in Black literature, music, theater, visual arts, and progressive social thought unfolded close by our campus on Harlem's southern edge at 120th Street. Our celebration is titled Creating a Better World, Teachers College Celebrates Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance, and it's been curated by TC's professor, Erica Walker, and Associate Vice President, Nancy Strine. Creating a Better World is also connected to a broad two-year New York City celebration of the centennial. We're especially proud to offer programs that document the long history of Teachers College community members' intellectual and pedagogical involvement in the Harlem Renaissance. Later in this series, we'll offer symposia, a listening salon, an exhibition that focuses on notable TC alumni artists whose work was central to or influenced by the Harlem Renaissance, including luminaries like Charles Alston, Aaron Douglas, and Alma Thomas, and Mildred Johnson Edwards, a school leader featured in Educating Harlem. Thank you for joining us this evening and please stay in touch for upcoming events in Creating a Better World, Teachers College Celebrates the Harlem Renaissance. It is now my pleasure to welcome TC Associate Professor and Associate Director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, Dr. Chris Emden. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to an amazing book discussion on Educating Harlem, A Century of Schooling and Resistance in a Black Community by Professor Ernest Morrell and Ansley Erickson. Um, on behalf of the director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, Professor Erica Walker, as well as our affiliated faculty and staff and other members of the TC com uh, community, I'm excited to invite you to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, this book, uh, Brilliant in Scope, Bringing in Multiple Perspectives, utilizes the education in Harlem for Black folks as a lens through which the scholars and thinkers make sense of the experiences of black folks writ large when it comes to education and how they make sense of their education. Uh, professor Ernest Morrell, brilliant scholar in English education, currently serving as professor, coil professor in literacy education um, and director of the Center for Literacy Education at the University of Notre Dame, is a brilliant man who was former director of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education. And Ansley Erickson, associate professor of history and education here at CC is also co-director of the Center on History and Education, who does amazing work on and in Harlem and making sense of Harlem in historical context um, in powerful ways. As you heard from our provost just a few minutes ago, you know, CC is hyper-focused on making sense of Harlem and how it situates itself in the larger landscape of discussion in education. Our, our traditions in making sense of and celebrating the Harlem Renaissance continues in this powerful work. You know, Yumi's history has always been about doing cutting edge research, uh, using wide ranging perspectives and fostering um, partnerships with, with communities and stakeholders from multiple vantage points. And this book not only carries it on in that tradition, but brings it to an exciting new level. Uh, the panel that's gone here today comes from multiple vantage points. We have these brilliant scholars and brilliant practitioners, folks who are in schools and community who are in the ivory tower, all coming together to make sense of uh, the topic of, of educating Harlem through this historical, but also contemporary lens. I'm excited to hear about this work, um, excited to hear about the dialogue. And oh, one last thing, this is, this is a talk about how cutting edge and transgressive and insightful this work is. Um, you can buy the book, of course, but it's also available online for free at Columbia University Libraries. And, and it really speaks to how the scholars and thinkers behind this work are not just constructing this work for the sake of some intellectual exercise, but making it accessible and, and, and being able to be, have it engaged with in community. So without further ado, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from them, Professor Ernest Morrell, uh, Professor Ansley Erickson, two of my favorite people in this amazing panel to discuss Educating Harlem, a century of schooling and resistance in a black community. 
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much to Professor, to Provost Stephanie Rowley and to Professor Chris Imden for those kind words of welcome. I'd also like to thank the Institute for Urban and Minority Education at TC, the Provost Office and the Center on History and Education for their ongoing support of this work. Over the last eight years, the Harlem Education History Project has been able to embark on a range of teaching and research endeavors, including and beyond this book, thanks to you. I'd also like to thank the Harlem Renaissance 100 celebration team for making a space for this project in their lineup this fall. I also want to recognize the 15 contributing authors who joined us on this journey and the Teachers College doctoral students who worked on everything from archival research to coding the digital edition of the book, whose web address you see scrolling across the, the screen now. Esther Sina, Rachel Klepper, Lisa Monroe, thank you. We're also so grateful to our partners at the Columbia University Library who helped make our digital work possible. So, Ernest, it's a pleasure to be here with you. How did we get here? How did we come to edit a book on the history of education in 20th century Harlem? Would you say a little bit about the path to this work for you? Yeah, thanks, Ansley. Uh, it's great to be here with you. I wish um, we could be in person, but it's, it's so great to have this book talk. And I got to say, every time I hear Chris Hemden speak, I just want to run out and do something. So <laughs> I'm totally fired up. Um, in regards to the question, you know, how we got here, you know, for me, this started almost 30 years ago uh, when I was a, a teacher in Oakland um, high schools. And the work that I was doing with young people that started with a traditional curriculum quickly transitioned into a focus on student voice, um, student agency, young people being involved in their communities. It was a way to get them really uh, engaged with the, the, the process of becoming critically literate, but also engaged in the process of becoming agentive and even transformative in their own communities. Um, that work, uh, which we now call Youth Participatory Action Research, was a mechanism for academic achievement and educational change. But I began to understand um, pretty early in that work that the students lacked an understanding of the amazing stories of agency and resistance that were present in their own neighborhoods and communities. So it became necessary for us to intentionally study the history of agency or representing uh, the voices from their parents and grandparents and uh, neighbors and elders. But it also became readily apparent that telling that story required us to do our own research, uh, to consult the narratives of neighbors, to knock on doors, to meet in churches and community centers, um, to look at yearbooks and photo albums and to talk in living rooms and parlors. Because that story wasn't really present in any formal archive that we could study, um, which explains the kind of absence of it from, from their own consciousness. So this work of connecting young people to histories of action for change uh, in the communities uh, and helping them know that they weren't alone uh, really began to move us into the realm of doing historical work, uh, what we were calling at the time uh, critical history and critical historians. Uh, and, and that became you know, a really important curriculum. But it wasn't until, uh, as, as Chris was saying, I became the director of Yumi and, and I met you that we really thought about the idea of what if we could uh, draw upon our relative scholarly traditions and, and actually try to tell some of these uh, missing narratives. You know, we were really inspired by the work of Trio and uh, the silence of the archive. And I really became inspired by this idea of unsilencing the archive, all these uh, wonderful stories, all of these wonderful individuals that um, could be lost to, to future generations if, if we didn't try to, to codify their brilliance and genius and power and passion. So it's been a wonderful, um, someone said eight years, but I think, I think it's probably 10 years since we had the conversation <laughs> on the train. Uh, it's been a wonderful decade and, and counting, um, but, but it, it's so great to be at this point. Um, but what about you? What, what brought you to this work? Well, I, I'm thinking back also, um, and I think for me, the starting point is really uh, being a, a high school teacher in Harlem. Um, and so now I'm a former high school teacher in Harlem. Um, I taught at Bread and Roses High School um, now nearly 20 years ago, and then I became a historian. And as a historian, I got to learn so much about the history of the school building in which I taught. But that was all after I left the classroom. 
So I think, you know, I hope that my students and I did good work together. Um, but I keep on asking what would have been different if in my classroom, in my work with parents and others, I had known that the very school building in which I was teaching was an emblem of black women's struggle for educational justice for their children. It was one of the schools involved in the 1958 Harlem Nine boycott. And I didn't know that as a teacher in that building. So surely the ignorance I'm confessing is more likely to be held by young white teachers like I was then. Um, but too few teachers of any background have had enough access to and encouragement to learn this history. So that's part of what really drew me to this project. And it has shaped how we've done our work, I think. And it makes me especially glad that we're partnering with a few Harlem classrooms now and that we're offering a summer institute for teachers that will be guided by this history in collaboration with the Schomburg Center. Um, so long roots for this work for both of us, right? Um, and I hope actually, you know, those are appropriate and I hope that we can imagine a, a continuing future for this, for this work as well. Um, so to move into a conversation about the book, I want to take a few minutes. I know you and I want to take a few minutes to, to set out the scope first and then the argument of the book. Um, but we want to be brief to make sure that the incredible group of panelists who are here with us tonight get to speak about what they read and what they think of it. Um, and then there'll be time for Q&A from viewers as well. So this is a book that includes 13 chapters, which span the full 100 years, uh, the full last 100 years in Harlem's educational history. Um, we open in, in keeping with the celebration of the Harlem Renaissance with the way that education, teaching, and schooling appear in the literature of the Harlem Renaissance in work from Dan Perlstein. And then the book closes um, very much closer to the present with the question of who's teaching in Harlem today from Torinda White and from Bethany Rogers. Um, one of the things that we've celebrated is how scholars came to this work from different positions. I'm wondering if you wanted to say a little bit about that. Yeah, so it was really important. And, um, and thank you for, for opening the space to think about how a historical narrative might be integrated with other voices. Um, so we have political scientists, we have sociologists, we have um, those who look at art and architecture, um, we have those who study social movements, um, those who look at literacy education and, and English studies. I think um, it was really enriched um, by looking at, at the past, but looking at the past through um, these multiple lenses, as, as I think Chris was talking about in the introduction. Um, it really does offer a, kind of a multifaceted view of a single space across multiple decades in time. I think it's one of the, the strengths of the book, and it was certainly um, enjoyable to, to, to engage these different authors who were, who were coming from such different, but I think interconnected disciplinary traditions. Yeah, I think of it as an example of, you know, historians can do things like read buildings. They can do things like read photographs, read yeah. literature. Right, so we're trying to think about the full scope of this of this study of the past. Um, so the book has two main arguments when we think about how it works across its thirteen chapters, um, and and the first one I want to share in sort of in a in, in reflecting on a story that has been in my mind since um, in the in the course of this work. Um, through work on this volume and through um, related projects, I got to know a very kind man named Will Buckery. Um, in an oral history interview, Mr. Buckery shared that his junior high school, Wadley Junior High School, known to many people in central Harlem, um, was a place where he felt known and loved, where his teachers saw and heard him as an individual where they built the relationships that were the foundation on which his learning could grow. Um, in a later conversation, Mr. Buckery asked me um, what happened, by which he meant that in his view, Harlem schools today were different than what he recalled. And we, he wanted to know deeply how that came to be. Mr. Buckery, or Will, as he would probably have chided me to call him here, um, sadly isn't with us anymore. Um, but his question has stayed in my mind. Um, and I wanna recognize that not everybody may tell the same story about early 1960s Wadley as, as Mr. Buckery does. And they may not tell the same story about Harlem schools today. Uh, but with the benefit of our work on this book, I think I would say to him that one part of what happened 
one part of the answer to his question is that some very important history went missing. Um, dominant narratives about Harlem schools in the early 1960s make little space for stories like Mr. Buckery's. They focus instead on narratives of urban crisis and decline, such broad labels that others like activism or relationship or even success have little space. Um, these are accounts for historians that often lean on a notion of 20th century urban rise and fall. They see that many cities invested in and expanded education markedly in the early 20th century when school systems quote unquote rise and become engines of mobility. But that city level generalization really misses how racism led city leaders to channel resources away from black communities like Harlem. Um, and then this rise and fall narrative character characterizes the 50s and 60s as a period exclusively of fall. Um, so the image and that image of a fall obscures the complex reality that stories like Mr. Buckery's are trying to teach us about. So our book rejects this rise and fall framing um, to suggest instead that at no point were Harlem schools not subject to neglect from the city, but also at no point were Harlem parents, educators, and students not fighting um, vociferously and in varied ways for the schools they deserved. Histories sometimes go missing for a reason. And like you said, Ernest, we've taken a lot of inspiration from the work of Michel Trio. Um, he calls this the silencing of the past and points to how relationships of power shape what stories live on and which ones fade or disappear. Without a robust sense of the variety of educational struggle and innovation in Harlem, without stories like Mr. Buckery's, it might be easier to choose technocratic rather than relational approaches to schooling or to frame Black and Latinx parents as obstacles to student learning rather than as deep allies in the process. Without insistence on recognizing the ongoing structural neglect of Harlem schools, it might be easier to blame students for their struggles rather than hold policymakers to account for the inequities students face in schools each day. So I think we both hope that this is a book that contributes to a more historically informed and a more just future. That's one of the main themes of our work. Um, Ernest, do you wanna introduce the second major theme of the volume? Yeah, so, um, you know, we were also very interested in um, moving beyond uh, the single narrative. Uh, you know, as you were talking, Anzi, I was thinking about just my class yesterday with my students, and we're reading Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison talks about presencing. And one of the uh, dangers she talks about in, in minimizing presence is an economy of stereotype. Um, you have a flat story, you have a single story, and those we take seriously, we talk about their contradictions and complications and nuances, and those we don't, we tell a single flat story. And so we really wanted to talk about um, not Harlem, but Harlem's. Uh, we wanted to talk about not one story, but multiple stories, not one storyteller, but multiple storytellers. Uh, often when you're, when you're telling a historical narrative about education, you might say, well, who was the mayor? Um, who was the governor, who was the superintendent. And so we wanted a, a diversity of viewpoints. Um, so we have paraprofessionals, we have unionized teachers, we have artists and poets, uh, we have uh, community members uh, who were standing up for educational justice and change. And we really wanted to privilege the voices of women, the voices of young people, people who are often absent. And so you've got um, the story itself kind of told from these multiple perspectives. But we also mentioned earlier the disciplinary perspectives that we bring. But the third area is just uh, we wanted the authors to really talk about variations, tensions, and debates within the advocacy movements in the city. Certainly people were unified by a sense of um, passion and and, 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 a, and a call toward justice, but they didn't speak with one voice. Um, they didn't always agree. Um, there were many variations. There were many nuances. There were um, really powerful and profound conversations and there are ongoing conversations about what this movement looks like and what we can learn from it. Um, but I think it's also important uh, to acknowledge that, that in the plurality of these voices, we really um, see the antecedents of some larger national movements. Harlem's educational visions were not only varied, but they became national exemplars.
you think about the field of black history and its roots in Harlem Schomburg Collection Library, mm -hmm. or Kenneth and Mamie Clark uh, pioneering educational practices that informed what we called uh, compensatory education at the time. Uh, Deborah Meyer and her work in East Harlem and the small school approach that spread nationally. Uh, Jeff Canada um, and his community-wide educational transformation through the Promise Zones became a model that was adopted by federal policymakers. Um, those are just a few examples. But what I what I think we've done, um, hopefully, uh, is pluralize uh, the the voices that that were present. Um, polyvocality is is a term that I think about a lot. But um, you know, in the spirit of Toni Morrison, the presences uh, of all of these folks. Um, who fought so hard over this past century so that their children could have an education that w warranted the dignity and genius uh, that was present in the community. Uh, so, but it's not all one voice <laughs> it's, and, and it's not all unified, um, but it certainly is profound. And I think uh, while we may not have gotten every voice and I think some of the questions in the Q&A will transition to, we'll talk about what we missed. We tried to be as encompassing as we could um, in these perspectives. Yes, thank you. Um, so I hope that gives people a sense of what we see as kind of threads or threads running through the various chapters of our book and, and um, or the sort of interpretive glue that might link them. Um, but we, we want to stop and not speak in too much specificity because we have asked this wonderful panel of people to read and talk with us. Um, and so you're going to get to hear from them um, about some of these uh, histories and how they matter. Um, so let me introduce people um, and uh, in the process, thank them for being here with us tonight. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce uh, Reggie Higgins, who is the principal of PS125, the Ralph Bunch School on 123rd Street between Amsterdam Avenue and Morningside Avenue in Harlem. Welcome. Thanks for being with us tonight. And then I'd like to introduce Cedra Sebastian, who is an educator and organizer. For 18 years, she was Associate Direct Executive Director of the Brotherhood Sister Soul, a Harlem youth development organization. Thank you for being with us, Cedra. Uh, and Rosie Frischella, next, is a high school teacher and an active member of the Moore Social Justice Caucus of the United Federation of Teachers and of NICOR, the New York Collective of Radical Educators. Welcome. I want to say that both Reggie and Rosie are working educators in schools right now, which means they're superheroes for being able to be with us um, on top of the challenges of being teachers and, and uh, principals right now. So thank you both. Um, and I'm also really happy to get to welcome Dr. Basil Smichael, who teaches at Rutgers University and Teachers College and is a frequent commentator on politics. He has long been involved in education educate Harlem, including as a founding board member of the Eagle Academy for Young Men. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. And Ernest is going to start us off with a first question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and this one it, it is for everyone. Um, we'd like you to tell us about a story, um, a piece of history that you encountered in the volume that really struck you. Uh, what was it and why does it stand out to you? Uh, and, and more specifically, what does it mean for the work you're currently doing? Um, we'll start with you, Reggie. So I really love the fact of how the book opened up talking about Gertrude Eyre. And they described really that she was a, a phenomenal leader in a time when women had a, diff a difficult track trying to assume the role of uh, being a principal. But Principal Eyre had this belief that what was lacking in schools was this idea that Black people needed hope and inspiration. And she felt that there was a philosophy of how kids learn best that could better communicate those ideas of really understanding that we're all people and teaching Black people to see our sense of our humanity. Like I was really enthralled with the sense that she had these five guiding principles when she was working like with children. And she would talk about that one, you're a person, you're a human, seeing your sense of humanity. And that kind of goes against what was taking place in other parts of the country where Blacks were being dehumanized and Blacks were being taught how to see themselves just as a, a source of uh, a resource to work, um, to be subservient. And she wanted Black people to understand, I want you to fully participate in your life. Um, 
but she was doing it through the lens of uh, progressive education. She also wanted to really ensure that people understand that you don't have to feel inferior to anyone, to understand that you have a responsibility to your community, to your nation, and also that you have a contribution to the world. Why that's important is that for me, my school building um, before it became a public school was a private school that opened um, by John D. Rockefeller. It was called the Lincoln School. And I always wondered, what was taking place in other parts of Harlem, um, specifically for Black people. Um, and when you think about the work of what Gertrude Eyre was doing, it kind of helps understand that there were educational leaders that were also trying to create access and equity for the most underserved in the city at that time and continue to be. And I think that the implications are that how can we create a space where young people, again, make meaning for themselves, that they see that the school and that their learning environment is the third teacher in the classroom, that the environment in itself has to be designed in a way that makes an, inv that an individual wanna learn that she also wanted kids to understand that learning doesn't also have to take place um, in the confines of a wall, that learning also takes place in the community. And most importantly, that she would continue to push this idea that learning is done by the learner. These ideas, you know, unfortunately are not dominant ideas, not, not the progressive education, you know, isn't something that we still talk about in education, it is, but that it's something that we struggle with against this idea of external accountability and how we support black children and other children of color on improving their learning outcomes through this very myopic way of getting strong test scores. And I think what you know, people like um, Principal Ayer was trying to say is that if you don't expose children to a more holistic uh, approach of learning, exposing them to the arts, connecting the learning in ways that are relevant and meaningful for them, that learning doesn't take place. And so it was very um, eye-opening, but it also inspired me to kind of continue the work that I'm doing. PS125 is the first progressive public elementary school in District 5 right now. And the fact that we're able to lead this work in District 5 kind of reminds me that people like Principal Ayer started this for us. And so it's up to people like myself and my teachers to continue this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Citra. Thank you, Ernest, and thank you, Ainsley, for the invitation to be with you all today. Um, there's so much about the book that resonated with me, and so I'm going to reflect on two stories in particular. Um, and so one comes from chapter nine, which was written by Russell Rickford, um, Black Power as Educational Renaissance. Um, and for me, it was this really cool opportunity to learn more about the rich history of how conversations and curriculum that were grounded in power, transformation, and liberation existed in Harlem schools in the 60s and 70s, which is where the bulk of the text takes us and how we see that today. Um, and so when Russell is writing about um, establishments that strove to cultivate Black and Puerto Rican identity, um, we see many examples in Harlem today of organizations that are focused on activism, arts and activism, resources, community-based organizations, research centers that are also centering Black power, but all the other diasporic communities that Ho Harlem has grown to, to see as a part of its home. Um, and so while the demographics have shifted in Harlem from 1960s to 60 years later in 2020, when we say Black, we're not just talking about one monolithic group of folks, and Harlem is an example of that. I think about you know, when I used to walk down 116th Street <laughs> from the west to east side, and you can see the diaspora of Black Harlem going from west to east, right? Um, you can see the changes in the Latinx identity in Harlem, which was at one point majority Puerto Rican and has now grown to include Dominicans, Colombians, Ecuadorians, Mexicans, and folks from other Latin American and South American countries as well as the Caribbean. When I think about Harlem today and I think about institutions that are very much grounded in 
power, transformation, and liberation, I think about the organization that I had the opportunity to co-lead for such a long time, the Brotherhood Sister Soul, which is located in West Harlem. I also think about organizations like Street Corner Resources that's run by Sister Sekou that really focuses on addressing um, violence within the uh, community, ending violence, but also bringing other resources to Harlem so that folks in the community have exactly what they need to make Harlem home. I think about institutions like the Caribbean Cultural Center, the Schomburg, um, institutions like Firelight Media, the National Black Theater, all these rich institutions that are really spaces for Harlemites and other folks who come to Harlem um, to explore what being in the community that's connected to power, transformation, and liberation can look like. And so while the author for this particular chapter centers organizations like the Panthers, the Black Panthers, and the Young Lords, I think 60 years later, we can look at some of these institutions of being um, either directly grounded in those histories, inspired by that work, but definitely spaces that are thinking about how they're using their platforms, how they're using their resources to be a space for Harlem to think about liberation. The other story that really resonates with me I think it's very much connected to um, some of what is happening now in New York City, right? So again, a shout out to um, Rosie and to um, Principal Higgins that you are educators and that you know educators in New York City um, are essential. And I think um, at the same time have experienced what it's like to be deemed essential, but also treated as though you are disposable at the same time. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's something that we're seeing across the nation of how educators are being treated. And in this particular chapter, chapter six, um, written by Clarence Taylor, um, one of the things that we see here is how race and politics get in the way of schools and educators being able to do what they were meant to do, which is to center young people and to make sure that they're doing work that is uplifting community. Um, and so it was really interesting to hear about the teachers union and the guild. I had no clue that they existed and the type of nerd that I am, I went into <laughs> all the different archives in the New York Times and was looking at all of these transcripts and um, really enjoyed doing some more digging to look at what that tension was all about. Um, but um, it was really interesting to see these two unions at the time, um, and really the tension really came uh, in the 1950s, um, to see how that tension spilled out and really um, broke alliances that were building around um, parents and teachers. Um, communism, the big red scare, that got in the way of people really centering young people and centering communities. So it made me reflect on today, all the different things that get in the way of schools and educators being able to center young people. Um, in that chapter, there's a lot of data about um, segregation for folks who are not aware. Um, there's conversations about what um, the Brown decision in 1954 meant nationally, but specifically in New York City. Um, and we see still today, whether we're looking at publications coming out of Columbia or Steinhardt, the New York Times, Chalkbeat, like New York City is still one of the most segregated school districts in the nation. So how is that? How is that? And I would argue because we're allowing major systematic issues to get in the way of centering young people. Um, and for me to see those correlations 60 years ago to now um, was really interesting, but also really frustrating that that's still where we're sitting now. Um, and so I, I think after reading that chapter, a lot more upset <laughs> and uh, a lot of unanswered questions, but I do think that a part of the the answer is to make sure that those of us who say we care about teachers, those of us who say we care about young people and we care about public education, that we're doing our due diligence to actually listen to what students are asking for, to actually listen to what educators and families are asking for, to fund them properly, 
to ask them what makes them proud about being a student, what makes them proud about being an educator, and to figure out the policies and the funding that we need to put into place to ensure that we are lifting young people and we are lifting the people who serve them. Great. Thank you so much, Sidra. Uh, Rosie? Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I mean, Sidra, I, I totally geeked out on that chapter as well. Um, Clarence Taylor is amazing. Um, and I feel like that chapter just really highlighted, um, like saying like, if you don't learn from your history, you're going to repeat it. And I feel like that chapter could be happening today. Um, and the tension between the teachers union and the guild I see today, um, except I would call the guild, the UFT and the unity caucus. And I would say the teachers union is a lot like more and night core and, and teachers unite. Um, who actually named themselves after the teachers union. And for those who don't know that history, I just wanted to read a little bit from this chapter um, about who the TU was, right? It says the TU was founded in 1916 by social Democrats who maintained the teachers should receive decent salaries and respect from administrators. And to move a little bit forward, they said the TU led a major campaign to end institutional racism in the educational system, similar to what is known today as social justice unionism. The union fought for higher wages and improved working conditions for its members, and also made social and racial justice for people of color in the city a central mission. And I think this is critical to our organizing today. Um, and kind of juxtaposition to the guild, right, where the guild's major objective was to provide better pay, improve working conditions for teachers and other benefits for its members. The Guild, unlike the TU, did not build strong alliances with parents of color and civic organizations in Harlem and other black communities in New York. Um, and I think the big distinctions between the TU and the Guild is the TU was building with the community. They went to the parents, um, they, they went to the students, they, they aligned themselves with them, right? They fought for black studies. They fought for the hiring of black educators, where the guild really perpetuated this fear of, of the community that you're teaching um, and actually like protected white teachers from their students. And I, I don't understand how you could ever teach students that you were scared of. You know, and I see this today um, with the UFT. Like I, I'm the chapter leader in my of of my of the UFT for my school. And you know, like a lot of times we're fighting for things like this safe room, right? We're fighting for things like to keep security guards or safety agents in schools for metal detectors, right? Um, I feel like if we don't look at institutional racism and the ways in which we are perpetuating it, especially as a white educator, then I can't teach my students. I can't love them if I don't reflect on my own self. Um, and I think this is really important to the work that we're doing today is that we need to align ourselves with, with our students. We need to listen to them. We need to listen to our parents. Um, and I feel like when we do that work, that's when we become stronger schools. That's when we become stronger educators. Like even in the pandemic right now, like we, my school, we operated from the, from the notion of protecting ourselves. And so we, we reached out to our students, we reached out to our parents and we asked them, what do you need? What do you need to feel safe in our school? And we went from that. Um, and I think that's what we need to continue to do. Um, in the organization that I'm working with more, um, you know, we're fighting for things like the Black Lives Matter Week of Action. And now this year we've made it a year of purpose. Um, and we've actually brought it to the UFT multiple times and they have not endorsed it as a union, which I think is shameful, right? Um, and one of the reasons they said that was because they said that it was divisive, you know? And to me, you know, it can, it's not, it, it's only divisive if we make it, right? We need to understand why we need to center our students, why we need to center our parents, um, and why we need to look at institutional racism. Because as long as we don't look at the roots of the causes of um, disparities in education, then we're constantly gonna be blaming teachers. We're constantly gonna be blaming students. Um, we're constantly gonna be blaming parents rather than the actual roots, rather than the causes of the, the discrepancies or the, the disparities of education. 
So um, I'm really excited to read this chapter with other educators um, and discuss it with you all. And the whole entire book is, a, is amazing. And I think there's so much history that we can learn um, from and hopefully make us better and stronger in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rosie. It's, uh, it's super exciting to hear you and Cedra and, and Reggie talk about how, how the book has, has spoken to you. Um, but now we'll hear from Basil. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ansley and Ernest, for allowing me to, um, giving me the opportunity to say a few words today about this book, and I'm glad to be here with my fellow panelists. I'm actually very thankful for this book uh, because it provides a rich history to many of the activists and leaders that I've met very early in my own career. Um, and it goes back as far as 1994 when uh, I was working at an organization called the uh, Empowerment Zone, uh, which was part of a, or the result of federal legislation to provide what wound up becoming $300 million for this uh, part of Harlem, Upper Manhattan, and the South Bronx to spend. And I remember uh, it was uh, written by Charlie Rangel, the original legislation, but as the money was um, given to, to this organization to figure out what the priorities were going to be for Harlem, um, I was a young student in, in a public affairs program at Columbia, I just started graduate school, and was uh, was dispatched to this office in this uh, in a small office in the state office building on 125th Street, which gets some mention in the book. And I remember meeting and talking to Preston Wilcox and Babette Edwards, who were lobbying very heavily um, together and, and and separately for uh, to get a lot of those federal funds. Uh, to uh, to the youth in Harlem. So, you know, for me, Educating Harlem does a great job of weaving their stories um, uh, among the many other stories who ha and, and individuals who fought for equity in the public school system and for opportunities outside the system in furtherance of educating and empowering Black and Latinx youth. Um, chapter 12 uh, was the one that spoke to me a lot, as I mentioned, Babette. Um, because it, it really does capture for me the importance of balancing uh, both the uh, both the sub substantive needs and the push for uh, and, and advocacy for the changes that folks want to see on the ground, particularly among uh, uh, grassroots advocates, and then trying to balance that with the shifts of political power in state, local, and national politics. And understanding how difficult that can be, just in my own, you know, sort of work. So, Ms. Edwards, in particular, uh, in organizing the parents and thinking about resources and interests, and how even if working with certain individuals in political leadership may not work, uh, may not align in other substantive areas, that for moments that might be very fleeting and very narrow in political scope there may be opportunities to get the support for the, uh, for the education initiatives that, that she, was, um, she was calling for. So right at the beginning of the chapter, I, I noticed that uh, there was an invitation extended to Stokely Carmichael in 1966. And I recall, um, if, you, if you read Goldstein's Teacher Wars, that there's a moment where um, it's mentioned that uh, Carmichael becomes the, uh, the SNCC chair over John Edwards. Uh, the, the eventually became Congressman John Edwards, uh, the late John Edwards. He becomes chair of SNCC over John Edwards because it was it was deemed that Edwards was becoming too moderate, which is as fascinating as we think about his life and experience in retrospect and and uh, and, and the ability and desire and need to uh, get into into good trouble. But it's just interesting because because Carmichael clearly over the course of his uh, career and activism. Um, would be a transformational leader for many aspects of, of Black life. Um, but as we see throughout the chapter, the community is forefront for uh, for Ms. Edwards and her push for local control of schools with a system that is clearly reluctant to do so. So her fight to me is inextricably linked to other battles uh, throughout the book, like the fight for Sydenham Hospital during the Koch administration, which is an episode itself sandwiched between Mayor Beam's attitudes toward Harlem and communities of color during the fiscal crisis, and D uh, David Dinkins, who becomes the first African-American mayor of the city of New York, a uh, fierce proponent for Beacon Schools. And even though he, he did not get uh, enough time, I think, to 
uh, to put to establish and institutionalize a lot of his reforms. And then at the end, and after that, we get uh, Bayer Giuliani, whose administration clearly showed some very early uh, uh, animus toward uh, black and brown communities. So um, there was little movement in terms of uh, in terms of Babbitt's. Uh, uh, push for for equity in some of the some of the reforms that she enacted, even though or wanted to enact, even though there are reports that both Dinkins and Giuliani did want mayoral control, if not community control of schools. So as she pivoted towards vouchers and school choice later on, it's interesting to note that uh, there's a note that early support among New York political leaders came from uh, Republicans and white moderate leaders, which I talked about before in terms of these interesting alliances. I know that uh, just in my own sort of working research and, and relationships, I know that, the, that Governor Pataki at that time had seen, um, seen the movement by Edwards and so many other leaders start to build strength and was, a key, was keenly interested in school choice, even if not fully vouchers. Um, but by the time Governor Pataki had signed that legislation into law in 98, he had the support by State Senator David Patterson, who eventually became governor. Keith Wright, who eventually, who was an assembly member, um, and Bill Perkins, who was not yet elected as a city council member, but Bill Perkins at the time was one of the leaders of the first charter school in New York City. Um, so you had all th this interesting alignment of interests and what, what I then started to pivot to was this, this moment of reflection as I kept reading, because one of my early mentors, a guy named Arnie Siguero, who was one of the, an advisor to the Young Lords and was part of that church takeover in East Harlem. Um, we were at an informal gathering with he and another young lord named Felice, Felipe Luciano, and we were talking over lunch. And he said to me, every movement becomes a foundation. And what he meant by that one of the normal pearls of wisdom he used to drop on me. His point was that movements, ideas, even radical ones, sometimes have a way of becoming institutionalized. And oftentimes, once they reach that point, they may resemble very little of what their original intent was. So I thought about that statement when I was reading about Bad Bad Edwards', Edwards his push for school choice in Harlem. So because not only do we see the challenges at the state and city level as she attempted to promote vouchers and, and and school choice, but in thinking about how doing that, you got essentially a competing bill in state government by, uh, a, by a white uh, resident and white activists who were concerned about what it was gonna, what this would mean for their schools as an attempt to, you know, to keep from integrating, right? So, so we're introduced to the politics around the schools, the, the, the kinds of schools that she envisioned and one wonders if the entire movement, if you will, wound up being co-opted and altered in ways that have created more problems than they than they actually intended to solve. I do, if you know, in it, which I'm very vocal about, and it's it's in my bio that I do support charter schools on on the board of the New York Charter Center. Um, but I acknowledge the challenges that they pose, and it's interesting because in Chapter 11 we're reminded that schools were not only, and I quote, schools were not only for educating children, they were visible public institutions that served as meeting places for various populations. And they symbolize the broader commitment of the city to the neighborhood. But charters can also be seen as a quote, colonial outpost, another impenetrable agency governed from afar, which is mentioned in another uh, discussion about community school relationships in chapter nine. So in my own research, members of the Bloomberg team lamented, I, and in talking to them about this, they lamented that their reforms may have been, quote, disruptive to the community. And so since school choice options remain limited and dictated in large part by forces outside of Harlem, you know, I wonder how, you know, that, that would reflect on what's happened, uh, what's, what's happened since she made the push initially for school choice and its impact on families in Harlem. So, you know, just to sum, just to sum up, um, you know, I think it's a, I think this book is a tremendous narrative and history and suggests that there is a continuum, uh, that a lot of these fights are along a long continuum of support for parent agency and self-deterministic approaches to education. Um, I really think about something that Dr. Morell said earlier about 
documenting the history of agency. And I think that's a great way to put uh, what this book, I think, means to me and I think it contributes to the, to the understanding. And I just want to call out people like Arnie and Felipe and other leaders like William Allen, Teresa Freeman, David Banks, Denise Scott, Daniel Mosley, and so many others that help me understand these issues and these fights and that even in the work that I do to help move the levers of political and bureaucratic power so that I don't become the stumbling block for people like Babette, the Babette Edwards of the future um, who want to who want to provide agency for for the communities that uh, mean so much to us. So I thank you uh, for the, a, a great opportunity to talk about this book. That are there for you um, with with each of these chapters, I feel compelled because these fifteen wonderful authors aren't able to be with us to sort of to name um, Dan Perlstein and his work on the Harlem Renaissance and on Gertrude Eyre, um, uh, Clarence Taylor's powerful chapter on teacher organizing. Um, Russell Rickford's work on the Black Power educational landscape um, and. Uh, Brittany Lore's work on Babette Edwards and her really important trajectory as a, as a activist, as a thinker, and as someone who in some ways in one life manages to capture what um, Ernest characterizes as the multiple Harlems, which is to say that she substantially um, revises the way she thinks about chall the challenges of educational inequality over the course of her own life. Um, and the, the ability of one person to do that is, all, is a good provocation for all of us to be thinking about that kind of diversity of, of political and um, ideological commitment in, in any community and certainly in this one. Um, so I would like you all to help us think, we could put it this way, if there's a second volume, what should it be? Um, I make no commitments. But the, the point here is that I want you to, to be invited to think not just about what's valuable, about what's what we've been able to offer through the work of these contributors, but also the, the, the accounts that you had hoped to find when you opened the book and didn't, or the communities or the stories of individuals or, or others that you really think need to be um, called forward um, and into our collective historical and contemporary consciousness. So if you have thoughts about, um, about voices that might remain too silent right now that should be um, more present in this conversation, it would be this would be a great time to bring them in. Yeah, the first um, thought that came to my see, mind is like you're ready to go. Yeah, the first thought that <laughs> yeah. came to mind is young people. If you're gonna do a second edition, mm -hmm. I think it's so important to reach out to young people to to take them through what it's like to write a research chapter for something like this, um, to interview them, to talk about them. Um, with each other, right? Um, I think too often young people are spoken of, are spoken about, are spoken to, but there's not a space for them to share their thoughts, their opinions, their joys, their frustrations. Um, mm -hmm. And this could, volume two, could be a great way to create that space for them to have that opportunity. I think what would also be interested is to, um, lived families that um, are having a range of different educational experiences, right? I think especially with us shifting to um, remote learning these last seven months, I think about families who have children of multiple ages, of different abilities that speak different languages, um, how they are experiencing these past seven months and, and what the next few months might look like for them. And then creating a space for um, those parents to share their stories as well and their experiences navigating school um, and what that's like. I, I think those would definitely be two key pockets of people to highlight in a second. If I can, if I can add, just add to the provisions, I think I it, it really hit on something for me because I, I definitely think there's something to be said about our post-COVID, about post-COVID education. And with all of these articles being written about how um, how this environment is, for, is, is deepening the divide between rich and poor, 
I would love to learn, I would love to know more about how young people are faring in this environment, not just the challenges of the, of the adults in their life, but also the challenges that young people are facing, whether it's just, whether it's trying to learn, whether it's just engaging with their friends and, and, and colleagues uh, in school, their peers, you know, what it's like not being able to engage in extracurricular activities and, and, and think about how they manage trauma, just the trauma that they would normally have in their lives that they may be able to um, deal with differently if they were in a school setting versus, you know, not, you know, being, you know, having to just uh, stay at home. And the other, the other sort of thing, which may be a little beyond the scope, but I often think also about moments like this when um, other other forces kind of can come in uh, and take, you know, sort of take hold in moments like this. Um, we can sort of see that in post New Orleans Katrina, uh, post Katrina New Orleans, excuse me, and what what uh, and the changes in education there, um, which we can talk about if necessary. But you know, I wonder, given the given our current uh, pandemic and the uh, and the situation that we're in now, like what what are folks thinking in terms of how education is going to change beyond this? And therefore, how do parents and community leaders have agency in that post-COVID environment? I want to build on something that Basil said about parents and families, because I think that that's critical that we examine the role of all families that make up Harlem today. Harlem is very different in that it is very ethnically um, diverse than, you know, when the book was written and the times that it describes. And I wonder, like, how do those families, you know, what are their thoughts mm -hmm. on what Harlem is like today, the type of schools that make up the community? Um, when I think about like the IS-201 situation that was happening and how the parents were in outrage that a school could be created that almost looks like a prison, that what would our parents today, you know, I, my school is very diverse. Um, what would they say? Would they accept that? Or would they be able to use their political and social capital and maybe even their white privilege to force the, the Board of Education to kind of make the changes that they should have done then? And I think that it, it is important that we include parents in this conversation. I think one thing that I felt was missing from the book was more around the idea of spirituality and faith and religion. I know that there were some snippets where they talk about the role that the Nation of Islam played, but I wondered, since a lot of churches um, are almost you know, strewn across Harlem, what were the Black churches doing during this time? What role did they play in helping to kind of shape the, the narrative around learning and really helping to create, you know, an opportunity for young people also outside of the school platform, but also within their churches and religious affiliations to have another platform to kind of speak about ideas um, that were very important to them. Yeah, I also just want to echo um, bringing in parents, bringing in uh, students, um, and especially around this question of what is the purpose of education? And I've been thinking a lot about this lately, especially like throughout the pandemic, and what are we actually doing, you know, in a time of crisis? Um, you know, and the importance of actually like building community and connecting and healing and coming together and learning together. Um, so, you know, I, I would love to hear different perspectives on, on why do we go to school? What, why do we learn? What is education? Um, also, I would love to hear more from paraprofessionals. I, I mean, I really loved the chapter on paraprofessionals and I was like, I, I need to read this with the powers at my school. So I think it'd be really cool to like read it with, with folks, right? Like read some of these chapters and get their reactions. You know, like I'm sure it would be like super empowering for powers to read that chapter. Um, so I hope to, to read it with the ones at my school as well. So I'm going to say a couple of things and I think Ernest will be ready with the next question, but just on, I, I want to underscore some of the points that you just called for, for 
not necessarily us, but other scholars and others, other historians and other community members to, to dive into. Um, when we initially conceptualized this work, we really hoped that we would be thinking about education in schooling and in spaces outside of school. And as you can see, we have a book that's very much about school with a few exceptions. Um, but to Reggie's point about churches as educational spaces and to Rosie's point about the value of the, uh, of trying to answer the basic question of what school is for by paying attention to educational spaces that are not necessarily school, um, there's a tremendous amount of work yet to be done. Um, there are young scholars beginning to do some of this work um, on after school spaces, on, um, on community education spaces, on churches, um, but there is tons to do. And, um, and that's a real, I really appreciate um, your comments that help remind us that all of education is not schooling. And sometimes historians and, and scholars are, are prone to focus only on schooling in a way that um, might miss some of the more dynamic uh, potential that exists elsewhere as well. Ernest, did you wanna lead us with the next question? Yeah, um, sure. I, I also wanted to just offer um, a couple of comments about about the response because um, there were two layers. Uh, one, I, I thought, as Ansley talked about, and that's uh, who is the um, who is the subject uh, of of uh, voice. But but I think there was also uh, comments about who authors, um, who's given voice. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it had me thinking about genre. Um, you know, Cedra was talking, you know, it's not just the Haru story about how, how young people um, were involved, told by uh, adult professional historians. It's uh, how, how are young people reflecting on the past and the present? And so if there were a volume two, um, you know, we, we, could, we could challenge ourselves even further to think about this notion of polyvocality. Um, we, we, could, we could certainly add new new narratives about um, uh, churches or, or families or young people, but uh, I think we could think about authors from, from different locations. Uh, so, so here's a question um, where we're going to start getting some, some questions flowing in. Uh, and, and, and here's one that I think uh, some have spoken to. I think Rosie had started to speak to this. So we've been talking about Harlem and and, and obviously that's the, the, the subject of the book in a very specific way and, and the subject of this kind of celebration. But there are many around the country uh, who, who want the book to speak to them in some way. So the question is, uh, Harlem has had a distinct place in the landscape of, of, of Black America, but how do you think this history or the particular stories that you told apply either to other neighborhoods in New York or outside of New York City? Or is it applicable in your mind? I'll just I'll just jump in and say, I mean, I do think it's applicable. I mean, if you look at people, if you look at Bed Stuy, you look at folks like Al Van, who's very active in Brooklyn. Um, and doing a lot of the sim similar work to Babette and Preston Wilcox and others and tying their work to larger, uh, larger concerns about just attaching their work to sort of small d democratic and electoral politics, um, I think is incredibly valuable. And I do see that that happens all, all, all over the country. I think Harlem occupies obviously a very special place as the soul of black America. We, we opened, uh, uh, this discussion in talking about the Harlem Renaissance and the impact that that has had on um, on on this city and this country. Um, so I do think that Harlem occupies this very distinct place. But I and it, but I also go to Reggie's point earlier. It's changing dramatically, and it, and that's also happening in other parts of the city and in the country. Certainly in Bed Stuy, in East New York, um, in in parts of Queens, and certainly in the South Bronx, you definitely see. Uh, the, these these movements occurring in very similar ways, but what's what's interesting now is how different a lot of these neighborhoods really are, and the extent to which um, these new newer families, um, how active are they going to be in their in 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 local agency, and just two very quick things that I'll say as a result of, as, about that. 
one of the things that I think is interesting and it doesn't get picked up the, by the book so much, but it's, it's sort of there in that a lot of folks who were sort of black middle class in Harlem at some point left. And a lot of those same families who are much older now and raised their kids outside of this, outside of the city in the suburbs, in some cases actually wish that they had not left. And what does that mean? What would that have meant for how Harlem would perhaps have looked today? And again, and again, I think that that's a story that could be repeated in many other uh, communities across the country, certainly many others, many others in New York. And what would have happened if someone like a David Dinkinson stayed in office another term and had more time? And there were other leaders that David and David Patterson had more time when he was governor to try to elevate some of these other voices. And I, I think that that is a, another point, which is that oftentimes some of our leaders just don't have the time when they get into office and are balancing so many other pressures and influence to elevate a lot of those local voices that, you know, we don't always get to everything that we want. Um, but, and, and again, I think that that's a, that's a that can be, that's, a, that's mirrored in certainly other parts of the country. Great. Um, thanks, Basil. And uh, hopefully others will want to respond, but I just want to stop for a moment and encourage the audience to, to submit uh, questions. Um, is that uh, an, an easy thing for them to do? And they know how to do that. So, all right. Uh, so uh, it takes a few seconds for us to get it. So while um, we're waiting for those questions, Rosie, Cedra, or Reggie, um, you have thoughts about this first question? Yeah, I think that leadership oftentimes is about relationships. And I think whether you're in Harlem or you're in Bed-Stuy or you're in the South Bronx, principals and teachers have to kind of figure out how do they navigate the internal politics of their community to be responsive to the needs of the kids and families that they serve in their direct community. And so one of the things that came up in the book was this idea that you sometimes don't need money, but what you need um, is honesty and the courage. And what George Floyd has taught us is that, you know, black people have known that, you know, we've been, you know, treated by police inappropriately for century, you know, this is not new for us. And so now there is this consciousness around how do we engage and have this conversation with other people? Because it's not black people that need to talk with other black people about how do we teach police not to kill us? It's how we teach other people that are not part of the community to kind of engage in these conversations on what are you gonna do to use your privilege to kind of make this different? And then how can we use that to also think about how are we creating more access and opportunities for all kids to have equal opportunities in school. I think that it's not just something that has to happen in a Harlem, but I think that it is something that is relevant to other parts of the city and even the country on how leaders, um, all leaders, from teacher leaders to principal leaders to community leaders come together on organizing around some of these things that are most important. And that is, how do we improve the quality of lives like for our kids? How can we ensure that what we're going to turn over to our kids is better than what we've given them? Because what we've given them, you know, hasn't worked. And it's not safer today than it was then. So I think that there is something that we all can do. But at a local level, it's having leaders to kind of put those um, external politics to the side and try to figure out what are, some, what are some solutions that we can work on together to make it better. Great. Thanks, Reggie. Um, Rosie, Cedra? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in defining what is social justice unionism, especially when you have a workforce of educators that are 80% white. And so is it you cast a wide net and you get everyone in to engage in the union, even if they're racist, um, even if they have teaching practices that hurt children, um, or are you visionary and you lead with a vision and you do the work to, um, to really have those hard conversations Right and to call people in, um, and this has been a, a a point of contention in in the organizing that I've done. Well, some people say, well, democracy is getting everyone involved. So then, what do you do when you have problematic teachers? You know, and this is kind of what the chapter on unionism talked about when you know, like the guild was trying to like stop, like, protect teachers from transferring into Harlem because they were scared to teach there. Um, so I think this is a really important question for our country right now. 
Um, like, how do you engage and um, engage white people in a deal with like white supremacy culture, especially when they're educators? Um, you know, like I was talking to a, a friend of mine who teaches in, who, who lives in South Jersey, and they're not even allowed to talk about politics in school because it's so divisive. Like they're not allowed to talk about Trump and they're not allowed to talk about Biden, right? And to me, that's so sad, right? That like, we actually can't even talk about like the election that's happening, one of the major things in our society. So what does that mean for schooling? Um, and and I, don't, I don't know the answers to this, but um, I think these are important conversations to have. Because, you know, we're, we're in this together, right? Like, for better or worse, right? So how do we have those conversations? Great. Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, I, I think a part of it is the willingness to get messy and to have a little bit more frustration before we get there. But I think because so many things are connected to a term or to a cycle, um, and a few people were talking about this before, um, folks maybe don't have the time that they need to really unpack and undo things, right? So if um, somebody is in office and they're expected to move an agenda forward in four years, if that agenda that they're trying to move forward is trying to unpack centuries of oppression, is four years enough time for them to undo it? If um, the Department of Education is expected to be a place that is a, you know, small letter D democratic space for young people to learn, to build critical thinking skills, to become leaders, how do they do that in a cycle that makes sense for the young people in your family? If it hasn't happened or it's happened for so few young people and so few educators have been able to experience that for years, the time for me is is a conversation, right? The pace, like we need to move with urgency and we also need to recognize that we're talking about breaking down and busting open systems that have been in place and have been working really well for a long time. Um, and going back to what Principal Higgins was saying, it's also a question of leadership. We have to have the leadership that is down to get dirty and get the work done. Um, that is not worried about um, what it looks like or what coin phrases of the day they can use or put on a T-shirt, but really think about the essential work that needs to happen in order to make schools better for young people. Um, so it's a lot of work and it gets messy. And I think it's a part of the reason why some folks would rather not talk about schools <laughs> and, and transforming schools because that conversation is connected to so many different things, including uh, structures that people are fighting to uproot themselves from. Thank you all. Um, I wanna say a little tiny bit in response to those thoughts, and then we'll shift to um, taking some questions that are coming in um, online, which is great to see people with a lot of, of things to ask you and, and us about. Um, so the one of the questions Erna started with was, so this is a book about Harlem. How do we think about its resonance outside of Harlem? And you, you have made several important connections in terms of the specific histories detailed here. I just wanna make a larger point about method, which is to say that yes, in some ways, um, you know, Harlem is a distinct American community. The, the particular concentration of, you know, tremendous um, intellectual power and, and right next to Manhattan, all right inside Manhattan, all of these things make it very distinct. But the questions that we were motivated to ask here, the sort of what is the story of educational activism and struggle in this community are questions that bear asking in any American place. And when you ask them, and this is to go back to that really rich point that Cedra just made, when you ask them, you not only hear stories about how families over generations have defined their educational ambitions and struggled for them, but you also hear a very deep critique of the structures that, um, that people are encountering. And those are structures that are not only educational ones, but they're structures in employment, they're structures in health and in labor. And so very quickly, you see um, how inseparable educational struggles are from a wide variety of, of social concerns, all of which are, of course, um, even less 
um, or even more crucially foregrounded through the pandemic right now. Um, so I hope that people thinking um, thinking of themselves as rooted in places outside of Harlem can take this work as, a, as an invitation to ask these similar questions in their own in their own sites. Um, so I saw one question that I thought we could start with, and then we'll, and Ernest and I all sort of pass back and forth. Um, um, and I think this is a question probably for all of us, not just for Ernest and I. Um, how do we think about crisis um, in thinking of the immediate um, crisis that is COVID. How have we, what have we learned about how educators and community members in Harlem have navigated crisis? How have they approached crisis? And how does that help us think about the pandemic? It's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can jump in and I, I just want to speak from um, some reference points of things that I know folks are doing. And, and one of the things that I say to people often um, about the impact of COVID and the public health crisis is that it has amplified things that have been working really well. And it has amplified things that are just trash, that are just have been horrible and have always been horrible. So um, if you are connected to a community that knows what it's like to struggle, that knows what it's like to come together and share resources to make sure that everybody is great, that has been amplified. But if you're part of a community that is disconnected, whether that's a workplace, a school place, a place that you might worship, that is amplified. And I think what this virus, this pandemic has allowed for people to see are all of the broken pieces, are all of the cracks, are all of the fires that have been ablaze for a really long time. And so maybe initially folks were like, COVID is the reason why I fill in the blank. And it's like, mm, systematic racism is the issue. Sexism is the issue. Broken schools are the issue. How we fund things that really make a difference in a community, that's the issue. And so um, when I think about what we have learned about navigating it, I would hope that people have learned that you just need to name things as they are. Um, I hope that we've also seen what it means to really come together as a community. I think about Brosis and for the last seven months, it has run a food pantry every, seven, every single week for seven months. And this initially was a monthly pantry that was in partnership with another organization. But midway through March, they realized that they actually needed to do it every single week. And it's not a food uh, uh, distribution site. Like that is not the mission of the organization to end hunger in Harlem or in West Harlem. It's a social justice youth organization, but it recognized that that was a need that young people and families connected to the organization, but also connected to the community in which it is situated needed support with. And so for every week, for seven months and it will continue. Staff have gone out there for hours to literally feed folks. Uh, we see mutual aid being talked about across Harlem, but also across the city as a way in which communities are taking care of each other. So I think one of the lessons that we have learned is definitely that we need to name issues as they are and not try to cover them up but also we need to dig in and really think about community um, in proximity, but also community and values and how we're leaning on each other and on our values to support each other through really tough times. Um, I agree with Sidra. I think one of the things that really came up for me was this idea of how much lack of quality healthcare and how it negatively impacts kids and their families. At the height of the pandemic, 26% of the families that died in Manhattan lived in the grant housing projects. And you think about the fact that many of those families um, struggle with chronic asthma, um, hypertension, blood pressure, diabetes, and the kids come to school with that trauma. And as a school, how are we equipped to kind of help kids and their families navigate 
you know, the sense of loss. And so I think in a real way, it requires, you know, again, people at the school community willing to kind of say, we know that our primary function is to facilitate teaching and learning, but right now we need to lead into our humanity and make sure that we're okay and taking care of each other. Because not only are kids and their families experiencing this trauma, I also have to be mindful that my staff that also had to deal with their own sense of challenges and sense of loss also need someone to kind of lean in and to take care of them. There are kids and families right now in my school community that still don't have access to remote learning devices. And so you, you figure like in the greatest country in the world, how is it possible that even today, kids are still being denied, you know, their, their right of free public education because they just can't log into a computer. Um, and there is no perfect answer. But I think that, you know, as a system, there has to be some sort of reflection on how do we better prepare for these moments that will continue to occur. You know, COVID is just, you know, one incident. And I think it just kind of highlights that those that already were at risk really are the ones that suffered the most. And those that kind of were okay, like I had families that could go to their summer homes and I had families that were just, just trying to just stay alive and figure out how am I gonna feed my kids? Um, but again, in a community where you're able to organize yourselves, people are willing to step in, parents were donating and giving money, but you know, where are like the social supports that kind of already established to create access for quality health care? Where are the systems that support family with having access to feeding their families? And most importantly, where are the resources that allow families to have a wage where they don't feel overwhelmed because they lost their jobs, that they're going to be homeless and that their kids are going to come into a school and want to participate in learning? It's unrealistic. And so we need to do a different job of how we're also training educators for taking on this dual responsibility of how they support kids socially and emotionally around some of this trauma. And it can't be what the DOE is doing by saying, hey, watch this video on trauma and you'll learn a lot how you can help kids in crisis. It's deeper than that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, what you are talking about, uh, Cedra and Reggie, really resonates with what we were trying to talk about in the book. Um, Ansley mentioned we weren't interested in a rise and fall narrative, but we do have a structure and agency narrative, right? One of the things we learn, um, whether it was you, Cedra, talking about uh, brosis, at every crisis, the community has responded immediately with sophistication, with passion, and with love, and they've leveraged um, political allies, they've leveraged all the material resources that have been available. But at the same time, as you're mentioning, Reggie, um, the structures run deep, right? This is, you know, they, they, they respond equally. So what, what we see um, throughout each of the, uh, of the decades that, that, we, that we discuss in the book um, is incredible agency and power in the community and extremely resistant structures. Uh, and and that, that persists. So you, you, you also see that um, in, in the COVID crisis as well. Um, it leads ultimately, I think, to a conversation. Uh, I, I think that everyone has spoken to this about um, when do the structures relent and, and, and how do we come together to, um, to push back on, on these structures because the community agency has been there and has been present uh, throughout. Uh, I think we might have time for, for one more question um, this one comes from David, uh, and it's specific about the, the, the era of community control. And David asks, what, what does the history of community control of schools teach us about the role of minoritized communities working to change schools today? Um, I could say, listen to the community like they know the kind of schools that they need right don't be afraid um of community control i think that is one lesson we need to learn in new york city like we are stronger when our community is invested in our schools so we need to create structures that allow communities access to schools that invite parents in the schools like schools should on the weekend should be having birthday parties in them you know, like like space is, is needed in New York City and we should open our doors and find ways to create like opportunities for community to come into it and use those spaces. 
to Rosie's point, it's one of the reasons that the first chapter really resonated with me so much around progressive education. I was in a school that historically had low performance and only followed a direct instructional model. But when parents um, and myself and my teachers came together to really support this idea of how can we embrace progressive practices? Because we thought that progressive schools were really only something that privileged kids that went to Calhoun or Bank Street were able to really participate in. Because when we looked at the public progressive schools, the type of work that they were doing just from our perspective, didn't have as much academic rigor. But parents were saying that, you know what, if our kids are gonna to come to your school, we need to ensure that they have access to the arts. We need to ensure that they have after school programs, that you are attending to them socially and emotionally. But that only happened because you had parents and community leaders and the educators that work with me to kind of move this idea forward. If not, we would still be like other District 5 schools stuck in this rut of how do we continue to get good test scores and really focusing on a curriculum that's just narrowed towards ELA testing and math testing. And the people that lose out again are kids. I, I'll just add, I agree with everything everyone has said, and I'll just add just to put my political hat on that the challenge is the, the, the problem if you were to call it that, is that there are a lot of political leaders that aren't sure what they want. And I, what I mean by that is that you see the sort of ebb and flow of the, of the thinking around community control. It's the, it's the mayor, it's the leaders of the district who are trying to figure out, do I actually wanna be in charge of the schools right now? Or do I wanna be able to point fingers somewhere else and lay blameless, right? And so that's really at the heart of what's at a lot of these considerations because you've had several mayors in New York tired of being blamed for schools that, the blame for performance of schools that they didn't control saying, well, I want control. But then realizing, I don't know if I really want full control. I do want some buffers that will allow me to, um, to, to sort of step away from the blame and step away from the finger pointing so I don't I don't have to answer for everything. And that that's that's a challenge. And you get around that by, as was said before, giving communities control over the schools and allow, and allow it because they know what, what's in the best needs of the families and the children that are there. Um, but the but the problem is often a political one in that school, and it's I think important to note that education broadly and schools in particular, particularly schools and communities of color, are used as political footballs. And that that is something that in addition to the institutions runs very deep. Yeah, and I would add, yes, that it is, it, it's definitely about political leaders. I'm also thinking about roadblocks and how sometimes political leaders can be roadblocks but also what people value and what people fund. So I don't wanna get away from the money. And I do think that um, community control, when one community is valued and given the setup to actually control their schools and provide what is wanted and needed for the young people and the families in that community, that works. But when we're talking about community control and some folks are constantly having to bang against roadblocks, constantly are not getting the resources and the funding that they need to create the schools that they want for their young people and for their families, then people say, look at that, community control doesn't work. But what got in the way? The political roadblocks, not getting the resources, not having the setup so that they can be successful. So I think that that's something that needs to be named as well. If we really want to see community control of schools work, then we have to set up communities to do it well. I'm sorry, can I just add very quickly? Because you said something that is, I talk about this all the time. This disparity is incredibly important because it, it really does show how exactly what you're saying is, it exemplifies exactly what you're saying. There's a school on the upper, I won't name it, but there's a school on the Upper West Side where the annual parent contribution is $1,500 per household, right? So that school's parent association raises over $1.5 million a year to do what it wants. So when the city stops, fund, you know, reduces funding in different, you know, in different ways, they will find a way to supplement that with whatever is coming out of the, those homes, right? With that, with that additional income. 
Whereas two blocks away or a couple blocks away, the schools that the children in Frederick Douglass houses go to, right? And it's very different. And yet we saw what we saw when there was a proposal to eliminate the zoning so that those some of those kids could go to the schools on the Upper West Side. And you saw the, the vitriol coming from a lot of those parents, then you really do understand how people protect what they have. And then we'll, we'll draw, we'll protect those political boundaries. That dialogue, if you haven't gone into it, it incensed me so much because these are liberals on the Upper West Side. But if you listen to their language, it, it could sound like anywhere else in the country. And that, that to Sidra's point, it, when you're dealing with that kind of disparity, literally blocks from each other. I mean, how do you how do you cut through that? Um, it, it, and I go back to the earlier point. I mean, it runs deep. It runs deep. Thank you so much, Basil. Um, it it is in some ways the most appropriate place to end, right? Which is a reminder of these trenchant inequalities and people who are still deeply invested in protecting them. Um, and in some ways, it's also a very frustrating place to end, right? Because it might um, point us away from um, the the power that individuals and communities have marshaled and demonstrated in the in the stories that we're trying to tell over the last hundred years. Um, but it is exactly that structure and agency tension that is at the core of this work. Um, so my unfortunate job is to say that we're out of time um, to say that I know that there's some wonderful questions that got posed um, that we haven't had the chance to answer, um, but we'll see what we can do about that. And um, I want to uh, try to recognize the um, 15 contributors to this volume by showing you their names and encouraging you to um, read the open, accessible, free digital edition of this book um, at the URL that's streaming here. Um, these wonderful people came to us as graduate students and as senior scholars from institutions around the country. They were tremendously generous in working together and individually over the last several years of work on this volume. And it's um, a, a pandemic tragedy that we can't get together and toast them in person. But I want to make sure you see um, their names. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Your comments and your questions and your provocations for future work are really important. And they remind us that um, whatever happened to get bound in the covers of this volume is, is certainly not enough. Um, and, and I think that scholars and community members, um, I hopefully will take your, your call to, to, to advance this work further. Um, and I hope that everyone with us tonight chooses to read more um, with your good questions and thoughts in mind. So thank you so much.